Welcome to the Center of Light Radio with spiritual teacher, intuitive, musician, composer, and best-selling author of The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Yes, I am Keith Anthony Blanchard, your host of the Center of Divine Unfoldment and Re- enforcement strap in all ye spiritual astronauts as we launch for inner space oh just getting over feeling a little badly this week give me a moment sinus infection will do a number on you i hadn't had one in years uh make sure you go to center of light radio website you can do that by going to center of light radio.com there you will find information to all my books my bestseller the divine principle anchoring heaven on earth my children's book series, Eden Sky Wonders Why, modeled after my beautiful 10-year-old little boy named Eden Sky, of course. My newest release, For the Love of God, A Spiritual Journey. And the forward introduction, I think the introduction was written by my guest today, Mr. David Matthew Brown. This book is about my journey to India to experience the magic power and divinity of a holy man that came to me in a dream. What an amazing story. Uh, it was for me. It, it changed my life. It is my life. It is who I am today and why I'm sitting in front of this microphone here at Center of Light Radio. Uh, you will also find uh, links to my movie, Do What You Love, A Path to Passionate Living. This documentary is about my life. What's really about you? Telling you that, yes, you can go out into the world and live your passion. Don't believe what you were told it's just not balanced. It's just not correct. You have the gift. You have, you, you have what makes you unique. You unique. The part of you that came to this planet and wants to be successful, whatever that term means to you, successful. Make sure you check out Do What You Love, the movie. And finally, if you go to KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com, you will also learn of my free Anchoring Heaven on Earth audio meditation. Meditation is done by myself. Lots of really cool music, lots of stereo imaging, some subliminals in there, but it's all good. It's all peaceful. You can hear the actual subliminals. But uh, in the stereo imaging, I suggest you put some headphones on for a really far out cool experience. To call into the show live, um, to talk to myself or my guests, ask a question, or even to say hi. Dial 888-919-2355. Remember, if you're not at home by your computer and you want to hear your fave show, you can always go to the app store on your phone and download the Inception Radio Network app for free. That's the magic word. We all like that word, free. Uh, I don't know of anything uh, associated with the word free that is not good. Everything is easy, easily at your fingertips. Chat room, listen, live links, news, podcasts, uh, much more. And there, always remember there are many ways to connect to not only Center of Light Radio, but Inception Radio Network and all the fine programs they have offered there for sure. Now it's time to get down to Center of Light radio business. Let me tell you about my guest today, Mr. David Matthew Brown. Um, if you're hearing some pauses, I apologize. In between my dialogue with you, I'm doing what I can to feel better by coughing. So please excuse me and I appreciate your patience. Let me tell you about my guest, Mr. David Matthew Brown. I've been knowing this cat and I want to say cat because that's kind of how he and I roll <laughs> on social media. We just kind of bros like that. Let me tell you about this man. This man is dedicated. This man is devoted. Uh, it's even better. I'd rather say this man is a disciple to God. He's a disciple to himself and a disciple to healing. Um, this man really he helps me find a place inside of myself. He's kind of a door for me. Um, he, he provides me a really, really, as my friend and my guest last week, Mr. Robert Tennyson Stevens said, secure, secure. He helps me achieve that space. Uh, listening to him do what he does, pretty awesome and powerfully. David Matthew Brown devotes his time to sharing a fresh and unique message of transcendence, unity, and spiritual healing. Alongside his message, David's skill and experience as a speaker, facilitator, and practitioner of the presence are eagerly increasingly sought after by audiences across the world. David's unique positive spiritual perspectives are especially vibrant 
in his work as an author, a teacher, and a counselor, trained at the Agape International Spiritual Center. If any of you out there are familiar with Michael Beckwith and Agape, and that is an accomplishment. That is an achievement. That is a center of light for sure. <laughs> Formerly the host of Inside Out, David was blessed with the opportunity to speak with litany, a litany of guests, including Swami Kriyananda, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Don Miguel Ruiz, Marion Williamson, Byron Katie, Dr. Bernie Segal, Cynthia Jarns, um, and Matthew Fox, to name a few. David also had the honor of hosting and reporting at Dr. Jane Goodall's Day of Peace, where he interviewed top celebrities on peace, including Piers Brosnan, Salia Moon Fry, Mary Lou Henner, and Rose Byrne. As a speaker, David is in on rotation as a speaker at Unity Burbank, Unity Church in Burbank. He has been a guest speaker at many Unity churches across California. He has also spoken at Los Angeles Church of Religious Science, the Wellness Center for Cancer, Freedom Path, Warner Brothers, Sony, Paramount, Nike, the United Nations, Los Angeles, and over 75 other engagements. David is an expert. Let me tell you about his field. Uh, David has been consulted, consulted as an expert and interviewed on radio, television, and print. He has been seen, heard, and read on Hey House Radio. Oh, cool. I love Louise Hey Stuff. Uh, Spirit TV, The Atlanta Pratt Show, CBS Radio, The List, The Lisa Zimmer Show, Miracle Cafe, Awakenings, Blog Talk Radio, KCSB, 91.9 FM. Oh, wow. The list goes on. Free, Freeman Michael Show, Lauren, and so forth and so on. So we get the idea that David <laughs> is exactly what he is doing. David, welcome to Center of Light Radio, my brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. If I can catch my breath from that list of accomplishments. <laughs> that you, it's that it's you a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. And in an awesome way, dude, I, I really look forward to our chats, uh, especially in public. And so it gives you and I the opportunity, the platform to get real and get honest and have the pub, the public see us in our vulnerability. Um, and that's where the magic is for me. And I would, I, I would think you would have no problem uh, agreeing with that, right? Definitely. I, yeah, it's, it's wonderful when we have the opportunity to let down our defenses and just be open, open with each other. Right. And there are no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, we can hold on to it for a while, but when you cross to the other side or whatever illumination happens in your life, it all gets revealed. So I think the path opens up quicker. The, 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 the mileage home gets shorter. When we get real, um, you know, uh, I, in fact, I'm looking at my notes here. Just uh, I don't usually have notes, but I really want to get get down to some serious business with David today. I've interviewed him in the past and he's interviewed myself. Um, David, and you know, I, I love your honesty. I love the fact that you are real. Uh, reading your new book, um, 90 uh, Days of Heat. Well, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, your sincerity, your passion, your discipline. These are all words tr that I, I am purposely wrote down so I can read aloud. Honesty, uh, being real, sincerity, passion, discipline, intent, intention, dedication, devotion, being vulnerable, humility. And this is a very well-rounded soup, a very well-rounded formula for creating bliss in one's life. Yes? Yeah, it, and it also takes mindfulness. You know, it, it takes a, 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 each day offers us an opportunity to be mindful about where we are and what is unfolding and to be mindful of our breath. So I know that when some people, you know, especially on social media, they write about love or they write about compassion or they write about it kind of in an airy fairy way. And what I know about you and your book that you wrote and interviewing you and what I know about myself is that we're not here just to talk about it. We're here to walk it. And the most important thing is that we can walk this path and walk it every day. And as we're walking it, we're learning. And we have tools that when we maybe forget to be mindful, we could forgive and be open and honest about it and authentic about who we are and continue to move, move about on this planet. 
from like you had just brought up earlier from a place of openness, sincerity, and honesty. And I hope that, you know, obviously when we bring that into a room, that's what we will attract. Talking about people on social media, Facebook, for example, um, talking about they express their ideas of love and, and often it's in a airy fairy way, as you describe. I'm just not sure that everyone really knows to a level of depth what love really is. They 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 seem to believe that it's about being attached to a potential partner, a life partner. Um, it's it's a very very superficial kind of love. I'm not ungrateful that they're loving. Period. But I don't think people have a true definition of the word love to be able to know how to move that in the arenas that you play it. Right. You know, right. they think it's an emotional uh, transference from one person to the other. Right. You know, and for me, real love is not a transference at all. Yes, no, you, <laughs> might be able to receive, you might be able to receive, but it's only about giving. Yeah. Well, you, you, you give what you have. And, you know, we seem you know, in the third dimension plane on this planet Earth, we seem to dwell in this kind of give to take or give to get. Or, uh, you know, it mentions in the Bible, there's a great passage where uh, Jesus is confronted by the men and they bring this woman who they said committed adultery. And so they try to frame him because he's been preaching love. And so not only do they humiliate this woman, which is actually in our first solar plexus, um, that story has been with us for 2,000 years, and it's how we treat the feminine, which is awful. Uh, but anyways, they humiliate this woman in front of the group, and they try to humiliate her in front of Jesus and by saying, you know, she committed adultery. And so they kind of try to hoodwink love, which from a metaphysical point of view, is kind of what your ego is doing to you on a daily basis. It's trying to hoodwink you into believing that there's something else happening here when there really isn't. So what we learn through this story about ourselves is he goes up to the lady that had committed adultery uh, first after turning to the men, and he said, whoever hasn't committed a sin, you can cast the first stone. And sin is just simple, a mistake, not coming from a place of love. So instantly the men turn away and leave, and he, he goes to the woman, and he goes, um, don't do this again. And she says, okay. And she, she moves away. And, and that, without trying to describe love or make love something, that's unconditional love. Unconditional love is the recognition that most people are hypnotized by their ego, the suggestions that they're getting from their ego. And yet, as you know, Keith, when we go into meditation or we go into prayer or we, we go however we connect to the vastness of who we are, that deep, all that eternal love. That was really, really cool. That really just did a number on me. The vastness. <laughs> we are. Right. right, please continue. Yeah, so, you know, we rest and we walk and we have our way in the omnipresence of truth. And that omnipresence of truth is everywhere. And since that omnipresence is everywhere, then everybody on this planet is already walking in it. You know, I, I heard the other day someone brought this up and I found it very curious. They said, they brought up to my attention, you know, love your love your enemy like you would love yourself. And so let's just preface that for a second. Everybody has a personality. And there are some personalities on this planet that are not nice and tend to be negative. But I'm not called to love somebody's personality. I'm called to love them and who they really are. Mm. And so that may be a good reminder, not just for myself, but for all of us to remember that, yes, there are personalities that I, I can't stand, that I do not like. They're not, they're not kind, but I'm called to understand that they are going through a place of hypnosis, of suggestion from their ego, from their small-mindedness. 
and that that's not who they are. And who they are is the same thing that I'm discovering about myself and who I am is that, like you had brought up, is that there is one universe. It's called a universe. Yes, there are multi-layers to it. There are multi-dimensions. There are different things. There are uh, alien forms. There are all sorts of different dimensions to this universe. But it all is stemming from one life. And that one life is emanating as your life. But your life is a reflection of that one life. So. How do we achieve or connect with that vast love? We reflect on it. As a reflection of love itself, the only thing I can do is go back to the source that I am and reflect on it. And when I do that, once I'm reflecting on the source of love, the lies, manipulations of the ego, all that will vanish. They disappear, and the truth sets me free. Yeah, so, just like a light dispels darkness. It all just it evaporates away, and you're left with essence and purity and innocence and all the good stuff. Yeah. Yes, so we're, yeah, so that's why we're taught and guided and, and moved in the direction to keep our attention solely, our soul solely, <laughs> right. right, on God. And when we do that, we really discover, at least I have discovered, a wonderful sense of peace and trust and faith and observation and witnessing and beholding the light that is already here. A moment ago, you were giving the example of Jesus Christ um, with the situation with Mary. And I, I think there's a little more in the, the lesson that he exemplified when he made the statement, uh, those who are without sin cast the first stone. Well, if Jesus was the perfect man at that period of his life, well, if he never committed sin, wouldn't it make sense? Uh, excuse me. If, yeah, if he never committed sin, would it make sense that he would have picked up the rock and cast the first stone? True. But he did not. So it takes, whether you believe that Jesus was born and lived his life without sin, that make, that presses the lesson home even harder. But it also shows the other side of that was maybe he didn't because at that stage of his life, he was not truly consciously unified with creator. He still felt some, I mean, you think about the garden of Gethsemane where he says, you know, take this from me. Well, who is he talking to? Take this from me implies that so there's someone else that he's having this conversation with versus it, him being the full integration of his vast self. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. We are in an incredible time right now of different energies and things shifting, people being brought back into alignment and freaking out about it and all sorts of revelations. And a lot of people are being called to move and move locations and serve in other areas. And so there's, we're at a time of great shift. And you know what? When you're, when you're navigating a boat, you know how to move the sails with the wind. So the way that we kind of navigate our boat is we focus on the presence of the prime creator or consciousness itself or however you want, however you call it in your language so it, it, it brings comfort to you. So we focus on the great comforter. And we trust in our breath moment by moment that we are being guided because there is nothing being held back from us. There is no mystery per se. We are, we are on purpose. Our purpose is to simply be beholders of love, to be observers of love and give that love to humanity. And humanity could simply just be to bring it to our partners, to bring it to our kids, to bring it to the places that we are at right now. But wherever we are, we are being called to bring that love. And you know what? That love is natural. It's easy. It's not hard. You know, someone told me the other day, I'm trying really hard. And I said, well, stop trying. Yeah. Yes. You, a, a moment ago, you were talking about, let me rephrase this. 
often people think that having a, quote, relationship with God means that your eyes are closed a lot and you're on your knees a lot and you're praying a lot and you're praying to a source. And those formalities are an amazing step in the process of expansion and moving in, as you would say, into your vastness. And I support those and I do those in my own life. But it's there's more to the, the pie than that, more to the formula. It's not about going to church on Sunday or praising something. It's about being it, integrating that thing that you're praying to into yourself. It's about becoming that, unfolding into that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it would be as though I'm always reminded – of nature. So I'm always reminded of a rose. You know, a rose gives its scent to everyone. And the rose, like you brought up, is integrated in the place that it's at, right? It integrates itself naturally. And so I know that when I started my path and I did a lot of meditation and prayer and all the things that you were just reflecting on, What I recognized was at some point, that meditation where I was sitting down and meditating, I entered another place where it was like, oh, I recognized I just got done meditation and now it's my life. And then I go to work and then, and then I went, well, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. How could meditation be, (laughs) right? So, so we learn and we grow and we go, wait a second, perhaps meditation is continuous. It is so, your life. Yes. Yeah. So then what where am I meditating throughout my day? And now your meditation is part of your day. And you start to meditate on your breath. Because it's the one thing that is teaching you how to give and let go. Give and let go. Give to you and let go. So you go, okay, well this is I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna bring my attention to my breath. I'm going to focus on my breath throughout my day. And then you notice that you're more conscious and present and mindful. And then a lot of things happen. And then you start to up-level in whatever way you're guided to up-level. But you're so right that our life is both a living meditation, a living prayer, however you want to look at it. And within that, we are all learning. It's not as though any mistakes are bad or good or wrong. We are continually learning. It's kind of the point I was bringing up a minute ago, using some of your examples. Um, We talk about uh, or describing people who have the perception that love is this sentiment. It's deeper than that. And it also goes back to um, becoming it. It's not something you're praying to all the time. It's act, And that's a wonderful way to create humility, which creates a disposition for a door to open inside or just for giving someone blessings and healing that you're praying about. But it's about integrating that kind of vast cosmic consciousness. And when you do that, then you understand that love is not just a mere sentiment. It's not. Uh, a the dynamic that happens between people, it's, it becomes something you emit, something that you are, something that you, it's everything you say, everything you do. It's, at least it's your every intention. Yes. You, this just popped in my head that may help out the listeners that are trying to kind of wrap their little mind that they relate to on a daily basis around this. So if, in fact, The truth that sets us free is that the very presence of love is everywhere present. It's omnipresent. Just let's just sit with that just for a second. That means that right where the tree is, it is wrapped in unconditional love. That very presence is right where it is. So every plant, animal, human being emits goodness. Their very nature is good. And in the right, and in Genesis, it says not just good, but very good. So we are all very good. So right where we are, we're all very good. So let us now suggest in this omnipresence of love or truth, however we sit with it, but just the omnipresence of the presence itself. A problem has arisen in your life. Any problem. Lost your keys. uh, Bills need to be paid. Doesn't really matter. Well, you are... The presence. The presence is right where you are. We know that because in some passages we are reminded of it, such as this one, be not afraid, it is I. Or, uh, there is no good or evil, just the presence of God. 
So when we do sit with the answer for something, we have to put away the judgment and stop judging things as good or bad and live in that polarity or lack or abundance or wherever it is that we do our dance. We drop it, we drop those judgments. We don't ask for an answer or try to change or fix anything. We simply still our mind and we observe. And the very goodness of God, the very presence of God, which is right where each of us is, will bring forth an idea, a creative solution, something that will be easy and effortless for us to take care of what we had first considered a problem. That is the power of love, this creative love that is undefinable, that none of us can really talk about because we are being incited and guided through it moment by moment, breath by breath. And it is expanding and creating us like a, like a, like a, a river that is endless. It's unbelievable that we are all wrapped in this love. And there will be a time when 7 billion people on this planet will look across and see another person and realize who they're actually looking at. I love that idea. David, let me uh, say something real quick. When you brought forth the idea that when we see what we'd call a problem in our life, instead of trying to fix it or find a solution, when we take that breath, God breathed life into man. When we take that conscious breath, we are stating intention. We're also making ourselves available for that presence. And when we recognize that presence in a dilemma, everything you want is in that presence. So right. There's no point of fixing anything. And as you said, as we sit here, it's all good. So everything else is just, <laughs> every, everything else is just a story that we keep telling ourselves repeatedly. Because if in creation, it was good, it was very good. God created the world and it was good. Everything else is just a story that we keep droning out in our minds. Is it because we're bored maybe? <laughs> I, well, I think it's because our attention is, is misplaced. Right. Our attention, we actually believe that we are the personality. We believe that we are the, the thinking that is happening. So we relate to the loudness, to the noise, more than we relate to the truth. Here's a good example. You and I are both parents, and we, could, we both relate to this. When your child comes to you and tells you something, you know it's the truth. When they say it, you know it's the truth. When they begin yeah. to add on or lie or whatever, you know it's a lie and you just, you're with them on that. So what's interesting is the same kind of beingness is same with, same with us. Truth is still mindedness. And then every once in a while, the liar comes in to try to hypnotize us or offer suggestions about something else that may be going on right now. And that something else may be good or bad, or, or maybe this is the, you know, what, but it, it comes in, sometimes it's loud, and sometimes it's really soft. And it's like, you know, but we, as we grow in our capacity to understand consciousness, and awaken, we begin to sit closer to peace, and that our peace is never disturbed as much as it used to be. And so in that state of peace, we begin to see the game that is being played within us, which is this game of war. It's a fight. And, you know, look, Jesus went through 40 days and 40 nights, and he had to wrestle with it, too. And after he finished wrestling with it, what happened on the next day? He started gathering his disciples. He overcame the body. He overcame the mind. And he understood who he was. And that's a great idea for all of us that a lot of people are wrestling. Daniel wrestles with the lions, right? Noah went for 40 yeah. years, for goodness sakes, or Moses. So... Everybody wrestles in the time frame that they need to wrestle in. I, I really like that imagery because it's so very well portrayed in the movie Last Temptation of Christ. When Jesus was in the desert, he was confronted by the lion, confronted by the little girl, and so forth. Um, very, very cool. David, I want to get into your book. Uh, <laughs> this so parallels with my life, although I, I'm not a yoga dude. Uh, I do yoga in a different way. 
Uh, I process differently. A lot, a lot of the same, actually. But I went through, your book is titled 90 Days of Heat. Gorgeous title. Uh, did some reading in it today. Uh, I want to pick your brain a little bit about some things uh, about how it was for you so that I can see whether it relates to my life or not. And if it does not, that way I have the opportunity to open more, uh, to take in more. First of all, uh, what is hot yoga? <laughs> <laughs> what I like what, anything with the word hot before. I know, you know, what, right? what I like is that some people read that title, 90 Days of Heat, and think, to, think it's a sex book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or it's a drought. I know, right? So not, so hot yoga, just to simplify, you, you just practice yoga in a room that's 103 degrees. Mm. So in the book, the goal started off at 30 days. We can elaborate that on, on that in a little bit. Then it went to 90 days. But my own personal journey, I actually did 100 straight days. Is there a reason that it's 103 versus 102 or 104? You know what? I heard someone just brought this up to me. I think it was yesterday because I guess they do Bikram and Bikram is like 108. Uh, I, yes. I don't really know the reason that this studio, Moke Show, which is all over Canada and there's 10 studios called Moto out here in the United States, why it's 103. I, I do know that they tried to explain to me that the air in the studio is kind of this echo friendly air. So it doesn't uh, harm you in any way, I guess. So mm. I, I, I don't know. I just know it's 103 degrees in there. <laughs> so within, so within like five minutes, you're sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to ask you a question and I, I'm asking it because I think it parallels with my life. Um, I was in a relationship for 10 years. It went bad. This was, uh, post Catholic days, pre spiritual path conscious days um musician seeking out a record deal <laughs> sounds like a movie or a country song. yeah uh and you know she was my food she was my shelter she was my transportation she was my intimacy all that stuff and she left and of course i'm split in half and knowing what i'm about to face the question i want at least at that point in my life the question i want to put to you before you started your 90 days of heat your 90 days of passion. How did it feel? And I, and I'm asking this question to hear myself for myself, um, knowing what was about to happen. How did it feel knowing that you were about to take on this mountain in a 90 day climb or ascension? Shall I say, what was it like to be you to go? Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's a that's a <laughs> that's an awesome question. You know, when when I was separated and then eventually went through my divorce, I went through the darkest period of my life—a period that was just never ending. It just like nothing was working, nothing happened, nothing was working, nothing was going my way. Um, anything I tried, all the things I had learned in school as far as like spiritual tools, nothing worked. And that's where the Book of Light came up, came out of that period. Amazing and, book, by the way, the Book of Light. Check it out. Thank you. And so this period, by the time I got here, I had finally been through some forgiveness work and let go of a lot of stuff. So this was not so much about letting go of a lot of stuff or taking a deep breath and going, oh, my God. This was more like a new beginning for me, a new life, a new way of seeing things, being with things. Because when I originally started this journey, when I had the idea to do this or when the idea came to me, it was just 30 straight days of hot yoga. And what I did to set out to set my own accountability and be authentic with myself. So I wouldn't break the 30 days. I blogged on my experience every single day. And that really helped me stay accountable, responsible, honest, open. And, and what I said to myself before I started this was, I'm going to be open, honest, and vulnerable with everybody about what comes up on my mat. And I'm not going to hold it back. And I'm going to allow people to see what I actually move through and grow with in my life as not only a, a newly single dad, but as a man, as a uh, being on this planet in the hopes that maybe my journey might 
help somebody else that's going out through a bad time. And then I think it was in the book Day 26, and Emily, the owner of the studio, she said, she shared with me an inspiring story, and it, it's, I think it really serves all of us as far as how we set limits for ourselves. Her studio, the yoga studio I, I did this at, was going to raise $20,000 in a month for a group that helps out kids with music. And her friend said, why are you doing 20000 Why don't you do 50000 And it just scared the daylights out of her. And she said, well, I, I'm comfortable with twenty. I know I can raise twenty. And she said, well, why don't you raise fifty? So she said, okay. Anyways, long story short, at the end of the 30 days, she raised $59,000. Wow. And she went way past her comfort zone. And that's when she looked at me and she said, I was on day 26. And she goes, I think you can do 90 straight days of hot yoga. <laughs> And I had she four. Volleyed, she volleyed the tennis ball back to you. I know, right? So I had four days. <laughs> I had four days till my thirty days, and I said, "But I only have, but I have four days left, right?" Like I, I was, and I, and I believe that's when it really became like, "Uh oh," because I said yes to it, and I didn't realize that what she was saying was, "David, these first thirty days is your comfort zone. Like that twenty grand was my comfort zone. Now let's see what you got." So okay. that right, you say, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt, but that you say that. And the first thing I was going to ask you as we got into your book, and you can probably continue on from there where, where I uh, stepped on your toes. In the first of your book, you say, um, you're safe. Nothing is going to hurt you here. You're on your mat. And I allowed myself to go inside, go inside to the sticky parts of me. Would that be the first 30 days? Yeah, and, I, and 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 then it gets a lot stickier as we get outside the thirty, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because, because you know what I had to to work through on those first thirty days is day seven. I had been in the class for seven days, seven straight days, and each day I wore my shorts and my shirt. And I'm I'm in Hollywood, so my class has like Colin Farrell in it. You know the actor has all these, you know, beautiful Hollywood stars in my class, tan bodies, beautiful, you know, just body, you know, body stuff. And I couldn't wear my shirt anymore. I, I just couldn't do it. And I was getting backlit from this, you know, this uh, sunlight window that they had. And I turned to the yoga teacher, Caroline, and I said, uh, I'm going to take my shirt off. <laughs> and she goes, okay. And I went, I know, but when I take it off, I'm so white. I'm going to light up this room, <laughs> right? <laughs> and she said, David, don't worry about it. And once I took off my shirt and got in the groove of it, I got over my body image, which I didn't know was there, which is that um, I'm okay. So I know in the first 30 days, a lot, a kind of a lot of those, like kind of not superficial stuff, but things that we don't really consciously think about kind of came up. after. You're right. After those, like day 31 through day 60 was a lot of working through the ego stuff. And then day 60, I remember having the realization that this isn't a mind-body experience. This is spirit, mind-body. And my whole yoga practice changed. The poses became different. Life became different. It just... That that from day once I hit day sixty, it was, it was on. The depths of me were just coming out. Like I was like, "Oh my gosh, here we go." You know, when you said when you asked the yoga instructor about, you know, I'm about to take my shirt off. Of course, you'd say that's fine, but said, "But wait, you don't understand. I'm about to blist everybody in the room." Moving through, even <laughs> that that using that as an example, such places that we find ourselves uncomfortable, uh, they're meant. For you, to not use as a way to stay in reserve and constrict and clam up, they're actually there as potential windows to move through, to find, to get out of the box. Because, you know, first, that first step may be sticky, icky, and uh, I really don't want to do this. But when you do it and you find yourself not only through the threshold, but well into the door uh, of that place, you realize it's, it's not so bad is just not so bad and actually it leaves your your mental process because you're no longer consumed with that and therefore giving it your intention something else you wrote in your book 
Amazing writing, David, by the way, say say that I'm beginning to understand in my practice that by letting the breath into the parts of my body that may be tight and resisting, I am letting in love. My breath accepts all life as it is. Now, there's something I often say when I do public talks about my first book, The Divine Principle. There are the divine principles, which is a list of nine divine principles, qualities of the creator. For example, one, choose not to accept defeat. This is obviously a quality of the creator, the law of all possibilities. Uh, the second one would be show no, incontent, no intent to control, choose not to place your happiness in the hands of another person or in the temporal world. So here's a few different laws. But the idea that I brought bring forth when I do public talk is, for example, as you, um, when you bring your breath, your awareness, your presence, your intention to that part that is resisting, the same thing I tell my, my audiences, that as you read the divine principles, or as I, I read them to you in a public talk, whatever one I read to you that you're finding yourself resistance, ju- just notice where the resistance in your body is to that particular principle that I am reading. As you are reading it, or as you are hearing me read it to you, listen from the place of the resistance. It's like bringing that breath into those places that are tight. It's all vibratory energy, all energy of love. So the same idea applies here when people read these such principles that they bring them into these blocks, which of course the light will dissipate any of the dense stuff. You also say that yoga offers us an invitation to discover the pose and life offers us the same invitation to discover life without war, defense, without the past. Life invites us to discover it as it is, staying open. A lot of my life, still, I find a lot, often in my dream state, David, I find myself resisting that I would swear to you here in this microphone publicly. That is not a part of my conscious process. I'm very, very aware of the dynamic of energy that's moving inside. I'm getting very proficient at balancing it. Sometimes it goes out of kilter and I, I catch myself and I pull myself back. But often, I wouldn't say often, but sometimes in my dream state, my dreamscapes, I find myself having um, some of these defense postures, some warring going on with self. Anything you can offer? (laughs) Well, you know, I wrote an article called Be With It on Simple Reminders, and I think it had something like 60,000 people that read it in like two days. And it's essentially about letting go, because letting go is our natural state. So, for example, if you are feeling a type of defense, what I learned on my yoga mat was be aware of the defense. And as you're aware of the defense that is going on wherever it is, if in fact it's a defense, you'll, what you'll feel is energy. And as you feel the feeling of it, of what that defense feels like, be with the feeling of defense. Just be with the feeling. Don't worry about the thoughts. And when you're aware of the feeling of defense, what you'll discover is if it's the first time you're aware of it, it may the energy of it, the energy of that feeling might last for a little bit. But once it dissipates, what's fascinating that I discovered was that all the thoughts that are connected to that feeling of defense from years of your life fall away. And you never have to repeat that pattern again. Yes, that feeling of defense may come up again, but because you're just aware of it without trying to change or fix it or run from it or anything, just be with it. Be aware of it. The charge may come up and it will lessen. And then it may come up one more time and you're with it and you allow it and it goes away. And you never have to experience defense again. My sense is that in our society, in the 3D platform, we have a lot of leaders that teach us to change our thoughts, to change our life. And what I discovered was the easiest thing is to be aware of the feeling. And the feelings, that's where all the thoughts are connected to. Because my, my biggest thing that I was kind of 
going through was I felt like I was going through a bigger war when I was trying to change the thoughts to change my life, to have the life that I wanted because I was, it was a lot of force. There was a lot of effort and I could do it for a couple of days and they'd all come back. So by being with the feelings that come up, the sensations that come up, you do it anyways, Keith, just by reading your last book and you know, talking about that journey that you went on. And so as men in particular, we are teachers to other men that we are here to be with our feelings. That's, that's one of the great thrills of being with a woman. They help facilitate the nature of being with our feelings and being with things um, and expressing them sometimes when, when we have difficulty. So the beauty of what we are as love is that we as love do not need to be afraid of anything because it's all God, it's all one, and it's coming up because we can handle it. And when you could finally discern your feelings, what you'll notice is that all is possible. Well, you just left off just a minute ago, brought me to actually where I want to go with you next. When you talked about the benefits of being in a loving relationship, how women um, or men, but in this scenario, because you and I, guys, um, reflect uh, certain things. In your book, Day 14, for example, men love to hear from their partners, I'm proud of you. I know how hard you are working. Is that only in a partner relationship or in life? I'll tell you why. Because years ago, <clears throat> I was playing music at a club. My mother, the lady, who told me, ah, Keith, I know you want to be a musician. Go get you a job. The one that I ignored. <laughs> uh, one of the few times over the period of years <laughs> that she's ever seen me play happens to be when I moved to Memphis from South Louisiana. She came up with my father and my sister who had their, uh, they brought their three-year-old um, grandchild. I was playing music and I played my mom's favorite song right before break, which is a little river band song called lady. And my mother was watching my three year old niece dance and capturing the hearts of everybody in the room. And my mother begins to cry and I get off the stage uh, as soon as we went on break and my mom fingers me. She says, Hey Keith, come over here. So I said, what is it? She says, all of your life, you never received any approval from me uh, playing music. I never really supported you. I liked the idea for you. And I wanted to tell you that I'm proud of you. That moment was so monumental for me. It, it changed things for me. It was like, it's something I've been wanting to hear from her for, since I was a little boy. Somehow I was craving it and didn't know it until that moment when my mother said, come here. Is that something we look for in our daily life is to be recognized um, not only by our fi uh, feminine counterpart, but uh, society? Sure. I mean, it's probably the, the thriving force for a lot of people, this kind of a need for uh, approval or proving. And that's a that's a it's a strong it's a strong pull. Right. Because I, I can only speak for myself. I never took a class when I was a kid that taught me how to be with my feelings. When I was a kid. And so I never knew how to deal with this energy that was within me. In fact, it should probably be a class in schools all over the globe. And we probably have a different society because a lot of things that I feel like people move through right now is they don't know how to be with their own emotions and feelings and sensations. So they go dart and run and hide and camouflage and mask and, and play different parts and act like they're this way or that way, all because a simple energy came up in them that they don't really know how to deal with. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's your mom. Right? You're talking about your mom, and she's the nurturer. She's someone that is, we hope would be at our side. And for some of us, we, we had that, and some of us, we didn't. And it, who knows what was going on at that time. And I, I, you know, it is what it is. But what's wonderful, uh, the way that love works, is that she recognized you and, and kind of um, 
asked for forgiveness in her own way. And it was that's a beautiful, that. yeah, it's a, it it's, was definitely it's, that. That's a beautiful, graceful experience for both of you because it allows you to see how empowering and amazing that you are, that you were able to trust yourself even amongst people that were close to you that weren't really uh, supporting you in the way that you had wished to be supported. So that, that's a beautiful experience, and uh, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. You, you had mentioned your first 30 days. The trial by fire, <laughs> <laughs> quite literally. Yeah. This, this, the yeah, right. Um, and then the sixty day mark, uh, getting the hang of it, man. You know, you're starting to, you know, you moving down the stream and not paddling anymore. The stream starting pushing. How was it for you at the ninety day mark? What did it feel like to be David Matthew Brown as you reflect on the David Matthew Brown that died? I just remember on day 90, I couldn't believe that it was over. I couldn't believe that I had set a goal of 90 days and all the stuff that I had moved through. Um, so it was, it was so many different emotions. Like the first one was I did it, which is exciting. Um, the second one was to ask myself, do I want to continue and try to achieve a hundred, which I did. Uh, wow. So you know, it's there. It's just so. There's just so many different feelings and emotions and people to thank at that moment. Like all my teachers, there's so many people involved in that journey. I mean, all the teachers that came and went, that would come visit, that were part of it, that I wrote about. I did a cleanse for like three or four days. So the so the juice place next door, you know, thank them for that. You know, just I mean, pe there's people that were supporting me that came out of the woodwork and there were some people that could care less uh, but what mattered was that i did it and the the most important mantra i think the universe teaches all of us and if you lose it hopefully you can remember it today i can i asked you the question about how did it feel at the three different stages and it, it reminds me of a documentary i saw sometime recent um I don't support the use of any substances, but this is ingesting conscious plants, ayahuasca. There are three particular stages, and I, and you describe them so perfectly. First stage is, you know, the denser stuff. Um, when you have these spiritual excursions with these holy people, uh, the first experience, it's like you do, it's a nine-day journey. You do, you induce, or you have an experience every three day, every other day. So it makes for three days. The first part is always about the denser, darker energy. And the second experience is about moving it to some of the gray stuff, some dark stuff here and some light stuff here. And the third stage is all about being imbued, being conscious, um, seeing things in a whole, you know, pun intended, pun intended, new way, being imbued with such amazing light from the journey that one uh, underwent. Is that how you felt? Did you feel complete with a lot? Obviously, a lot of areas of your life. And are you? Second question is, are you going to do a part two? <laughs> I know, right? Days of heat. Holy cow! I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about the latter part, but yeah, I agree with I agree with that ayahuasca the way that that's sent up, and it's yeah, it, it, that's how it felt. You know, it it just. <sighs> It's just an amazing experience. And plus that, what I really love is I brought this up at a book signing the other day here in Hollywood. I said, you know, I've written two books. I have a daughter. I'm the first man to fall in love with my daughter. And when my daughter gets older, hopefully she'll open these two books up and she'll open up the 90 days of heat. And she'll, she'll turn to one of her friends, whoever, and, and have a smile on her face and go, you know what I love about my dad? is he never stopped learning that even when he was in the worst times of his life he continued on and he learned more and he challenged himself and he just tried to keep broadening who he was and so that's what i'm most uh happy about is that i have something to leave my daughter i can attest to that my friend you do david we are approaching the end of the show is there a final thought you would like to leave to the center of light radio listening audience Sure. I'd just like to say hello to Terry out there in Cape Town who's listening to this on the radio. And I'd also like to uh, 
let your listeners know that if they do want to have any type of coaching sessions with me, I am offering kind of a spring cleaning, if you will. They can come to my Facebook at David Matthew Brown, type in the th- number three. I don't know why. And you can message <laughs> you can message me and I could tell you all about it. It's pretty fun. It's all about helping you create and move towards your dreams. Also and finally, if you haven't seen Keith's movie or bought his book. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm serious. Because I wrote the forward for your last one, uh, you should, you should, you should really get it and sit down with those two pieces. Because what I love about Keith is his authenticity. So you've tuned into the right show. Thank you, brother. Any final words from David Matthew Brown? <laughs> Just keep loving, man. <laughs> what is God to you? All, all life. Mm. David Matthew Brown, thank you for joining. Uh, me here on Center of Light Radio. You're welcome back anytime, my bro. Thank you for having me, man. Next week on the Center of Light Radio, uh, one of David and I's mutual friends, uh, Marie, Maria Felipe, is going to be here. She's an actress, spiritual teacher, and we will be discussing. It's an inside job, so make sure you're here for another awesome Center of Light Radio interview. I'm going to leave you with a little bit uh, from the Divine Principle. I think it really includes a lot of what we were talking about here tonight in the show. Uh, These are the three tenets uh, you can find at the end of the divine principle anchoring heaven on earth. Um, Let me read these to you. The all-knowing tenet, if turning inward, unites me with God, my higher self, then it makes sense to me that omniscience, peace, is my natural state. The all-powerful tenet, if turning inward, unites me with God then it makes sense to me that omnipotence, love, is my natural state. The all-pervading tenet. If turning inward unites me with God, then it makes sense to me that omnipresence, liberation, is my natural state. The gift God has given to me, I want to share with you. I take great pleasure in sharing with you my prophetic vision of heaven on earth. Center of Light Radio. Your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Shout out to Inception Radio Network team, MJ, Joe, and Bob. Remember, you can go to centeroflightradio.com for all your Keith Anthony Blanchard stuff, archives uh, from past shows of all the phenomenal guests that I have here on Center of Light Radio. Remember, every night when you go to bed and you take that breath or breath, who you truly are lies just behind that. Easy to believe.